Welcome to the Industrial IoT Spotlight, your number one spot for insight from industrial IoT thought leaders who are transforming businesses today with your host, Eric Walenza. This episode of the IoT Spotlight is brought to you by the Industrial Internet Consortium, which we often refer to as the IIC. The IIC is the world's leading organization transforming business and society by accelerating the industrial Internet of Things. IoT One has been a member of the IIC since 2015, and I've personally always been impressed by their ability to facilitate collaboration between companies to bring new technologies to market and to jointly address topics like security and system architecture, which are fundamental to scaling IIoT adoption. Welcome back to the Industrial IoT Spotlight. I'm joined today by Michael Hildner. Michael is the Manager of Consortia and Standards at TE Connectivity. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thanks a lot for uh, preparing that, uh, that talk and giving us the opportunity to present our testbed to the audience. So before we get into the, the details of the testbed, just give the listeners a quick background into TE. Uh, you're obviously a very large corporation, but uh, you're a corporation that's often dealing with very specific niche uh, technologies, which all of us use probably without realizing that we're using them. So what does TE do? Yeah, indeed. So TE is a world leader in connectivity solutions and sensors with the mission, as we call that, to create a safer, sustainable, productive, and connected future. So we are actually engaged in many different business areas, such as uh, transportation, industrial automation, building automation, communication networks, and medical technologies, and many more. So as you said, we are a rather large company. So TE's 2017 sales were at about 13.2 billion US dollar, uh, well balanced over America's EMEA and APAC. And also our global presence is well balanced with about 40 manufacturing sites and 24,000 employees in Americas, 43 manufacturing sites and 29,000 employees in EMEA and 21 manufacturing sites and 25,000 employees in, in APAC. So as you said, uh, this is uh, rather large. So um, myself, I'm, I'm with the industrial business unit, which is headquartered in Darmstadt, Germany. So I'm also German. And our traditional focus areas uh, are passive infrastructure components, mainly for harsh environments, passive infrastructure components such as connectors, cable assemblies, etc., or other electromechanical components such as relays and resolvers, and also board connectors and other passive PCB elements, as you said, that are in most of the devices that we are using, but uh, nobody is probably aware of that those are components that are provided by TE. So, Michael, TE has a very interesting space in um, connectivity because you are, say, a very horizontal company involved in solutions across pretty much every vertical. Talk to me a little bit about your involvement in the Industrial Internet Consortium, and then in particular in the test beds. Why did you as a company decide to get involved in the IIC, and then why are you personally involved in the the test bed working group? So maybe I should um, first state that um, I'm responsible for coordinating, executing, monitoring our uh, engagements within standardization and consortia in general, which includes establishing and maintaining maintaining cooperations, uh, both uh, vertical along the value creation chain and uh, horizontal with partners from different areas, such as IoT platform providers. Uh, Besides traditional standardization, which we carry out mainly at the IEC, we are particularly engaged in industrial user groups such as Profinet, Profibus International, ODVA, the EtherCAT Technology Group, the CC Link Partnership Association, IOLink Community, and so on, where we directly interface with our main customers, the automation system and components, OEM, such as Siemens, Rockwell, Schneider, and Mitsubishi. Uh, however, with providing active connectivity, which we do now, 
uh, and thus uh, kind of climbing up the ISO OC model from the physical layer towards protocol and semantic interoperability, working with partners from different areas such as software and firmware companies and platform providers has gained uh, significant relevance to us. And those companies are easy to get in touch with at the IIC, for example, where we where we meet exactly those companies that we haven't had a kind of traditional relationship with. So um, these active components um, they they require kind of other types of cooperations, and we recognize that the IIC is the appropriate platform to. Yeah, to establish these kind of partnerships. And um, yeah, as far as this testbed um, is concerned, that is a very good example of that uh, cross-functional cooperation. So we have SAP uh, on board, uh, which is this um, well-known world leader in enterprise applications in terms of software and software-related service revenue. We have IFM, a IIC non-member, a world leader in sensors, controllers, and systems for automation on board. And we have the OPC Foundation, which is the foundation of the industrial interoperability standard OPC unified architecture, or briefly um, OPC UA on board. And um, I think that's a different kind of cooperation that we have they are experienced in these other in these other consortia that I was uh, talking about before, and and the testbed um, working group, of course, um, that provides the opportunity to even extend the scope of the testbed. So there are other testbeds which provide kind of complementary approaches, for instance, um, machine learning that could also be incorporated in our test bed. And there are always kind of opportunities to engage with these other test beds and to, as I said, extend the scope of our test bed and as such um, also extend the scope of our product offering. Before we get deeper into the discussion of this test bed, let's just quickly explain the IIC. So the IIC that we're referring to is the Industrial Internet Consortium. It's a group of, I believe now, approximately 350 companies, primarily technology companies, but we also have end users like Boeing and then uh, government agencies or nonprofits like the OPC Foundation. But all of these companies have a shared interest in developing new industrial IoT technologies, bringing those to market, and then also helping the, the market at large understand the space, for example, around cybersecurity. And today we're talking in particular about the smart manufacturing connectivity for Brownfield Sensors Testbed, which TE Connectivity is leading together with SAP. So let's dig now into this uh, testbed in particular, maybe starting with the, the topic of smart manufacturing connectivity for Brownfield Sensors. For the listeners who are not familiar with Brownfield, the difference would be greenfield, meaning a new facility where you're basically investing from zero, building out a new facility or a new production line. In this case, brownfield, we mean that there's an existing facility and the technology is being used to augment that existing equipment or, or facility. Michael, why did you choose this as a, as a focal point for your involvement in the, the testbed program? Our Testbed addresses uh, brownfield facilities because there are components in such facilities that are designed and programmed to process a specific task. And um, for extensions towards IoT functionalities, those original components might not be suitable to carry out the additional burden of additional data processing or something like that. And um, the testbed proposes a solution to keep those original components while proposing a solution to transfer data from the shop floor to higher level IT systems. So in, in more detail, so the, as you probably know or certainly know, 
So typical automation systems are strictly hierarchical. So we call that the automation pyramid, where local control units, so-called uh, programmable logic controllers, govern the sensors and actuators at the lowest level of that pyramid, which are these uh, typical automation cells. And in, in brownfield facilities, specifically such PLC, these uh, programmable logic controllers, they were selected and programmed to process the, autom- the, the original automation task only and may not be burdened with a heavy IoT data flow. We aim at providing a high volume of sensor data to higher level IT systems. We need to establish an additional, a different path than through that traditional path through the PLC. And that's exactly what our test bed is aiming at. So it's about delivering a high volume of near real-time machine sensor data to higher level IT systems to enable advanced analytics without reprogramming or substituting the PLC. And uh, I think that's also an important aspect and without impacting the real-time operations of the actual manufacturing line. So before we get into the, let's say, the technical details or the challenges that you're addressing in, in developing the solution, Let's walk through a potential use case. So what would be an example of a manufacturing facility that this could be deployed on and and a use case where it would be providing a solution that maybe otherwise doesn't exist on the market? This could be used, uh, for instance, to monitor and improve OEE, um, uh, operational equipment uh, efficiency. So that's uh, a typical example would be to optimize the ratio of uh, consumed compressed air through the number of manufactured items. So the original automation task would use the, uh, the sensor data, for instance, a position sensor which uh, enables the counting of the manufactured items and the uh, flow values from a flow sensor just to keep the process running. So meaning processing the zeros and and ones to manage the next uh, manufacturing steps. But there are many more, or there there's much more information available from those sensors. So, for instance, this flow sensor that we are using for our usage scenario implementation of the test bed that provides temperature information, uh, totalized flow and uh, current flow values, and all of these values could be made available. To higher system, to higher level IT systems, and used for some analytics to, as I said, improve OEE, for instance, for instance, to build the ratio between consumed air and uh, manufactured items. And from from those values, you could learn that some items uh, required more consumed air than others. A uh, question then would be, why is that the case? Um, Is there something wrong with the manufacturing line? Could we even improve the consumed air for that particular item? What's different for that item in terms of uh, manufacturing, uh, in terms of the manufacturing process and so on? It does sound like it's a very horizontal solution. So basically, you need to collect data from a a system and and move that up for decision-making, higher level in the infrastructure. And uh, we we're here discussing consumed air, but I guess this could be one of uh, one of a hundred or hundreds of of different situations where this would be applicable. Michael, yeah. where is the test bed today? So test beds at the IIC can extend from quite early R and D, really from the ideation phase, all the way up towards uh, basically having a, a relatively mature solution that's going to market. Where is the technology sitting today for this particular test bed? We have incorporated the test bed and kind of demonstration case. So there is this um, 
real-time automation system incorporated then the, the components that uh, constitute the test bed they, they are available in such uh, kind of a demo case we are currently looking for actual manufacturing sites where uh, this test bed could be deployed which is uh, actually a phase two of our test bed this the current status of our test bed uh, includes uh, two or three sensors and um, yeah a kind of um, yeah demonstration set up for evaluation purposes so let's now dive uh, michael into the technical details so this mm-hmm. is probably going to get uh, a bit into uh, high water for me and, and probably for a lot of our listeners. But I think it's good to uh, to push ourselves a little bit and try to understand things that are important and, and that are not really uh, maybe uh, comfortable for us to to deal with. So, but let's start simple. So, what are the uh, if we think about it at a high level first? What are the different uh, technologies that TE, SAP, and OPC are providing into the solution? TE provides a retrofitable hardware, uh, which we call the Y-Gateway. In terms of uh, product name, it's called the IoT OmniGate module. This is a remote I.O. control, which provides uh, interfaces to IO-Link, which is a digital uh, sensor actuator protocol to an industrial Ethernet, uh, which may be Profinet or Ethernet IP or something else, and an additional OPC UA interface, which facilitates the easy physical or which which facilitates the easy integration with upper IT systems. The fact that this is a remote I.O. module that facilitates the easy physical integration because the existing cabling that can be easily reused. So the idea is just to substitute the available or the existing I.O. module by that um, IoT OmniGate component. The core of that testbed, however, is a software component that is uh, installed on that Y gateway and that converts the I.O. link protocol towards OPC UA semantics. So OPC UA, as you certainly know, provides a semantic data model that can be extended through specific language extensions. And we did that for IO-Link. And that is also currently being fed into a standardization activity together with the IO-Link community and the OPC Foundation. And that's also actually OPC UAs or the OPC Foundation's role here to support us in terms of establishing the connection from that device towards SAP and standardizing that conversion and also in enabling or in supporting the security mechanism that are required for that additional path i come to that a little bit later once again, because that is also a very important aspect of our testbed here. So SAP uh, is the platform provider for our testbed. SAP provides a component that is called blind connectivity that connects to hardware devices such as our IoT OmniGate on one side. And on the other side, there are several options to connect to SAP tools. We actually implemented two of these options within our testbed. One option is with SAP Cloud System, and the other option is with SAP MII, which is a tool that may be installed at local level at the uh, manufacturing site, uh, SAP Manufacturing Industry Intelligence. The other company that is with us in that testbed is IFM. IFM is a provider of IOLink sensors and they provide the sensor technology to that to that test bed. So meaning the, the sensors that may be connected to our Y gateway or IoT OmniGate respectively. Let's just go back and explain a few of these in, in greater detail. So the IOLink, what function does that provide uh, as opposed to let's say a PLC? IOLink is at the lowest layer of that 
automation pyramid. It um, collects data uh, or the, the sensors, they collect data from, from machines or uh, other types of equipment from the shop floor. IOLink is uh, a smart sensor protocol. IOLink itself is standardized as uh, IEC 61131 9. There are different levels in terms of communication performance. So we are using the, the highest level for, for our test bed with the sensors that we have applied here. What is particularly interesting is that IOLink also allows for configuring the sensors from either the IT level or from, from PLC level. So actually a IoT IOLink system consists of a so-called IOLink master, which governs the IOLink device, which may be a sensor or an actuator. And this IOLink master, for instance, that is implemented in that IoT OmniGate and um, may be configured according to the actual automation system needs in terms of cycle times or in terms of yes, uh, other parameters that are associated with sensors or actuators. And the other interface of such an IO-Link master is towards industrial Ethernet or industrial bus system, such as Profinet or Ethernet IP. So what would it, this look like in terms of execution? We'd have a Y gateway that would be deployed somewhere on the, on the shop floor. Mm -hmm. Would we then have an IO-Link device that would be installed on every sensor or what would that the the hardware configuration actually look like yeah. uh, at the sensor level iot omnigate that that provides um eight interfaces to iolink devices so uh, on the iot omnigate or the wide uh, gateway there are eight iolink masters available that govern those iolink devices that may be either uh, iolink sensors or iolink Actuators. I see. Okay, so we can have eight uh, eight devices per master. And when you're saying an yeah. IOLink, uh, is it the case then that IOLink would be, let's say, a, a standard, and this system would only work with uh, devices uh, with sensors or actuators that are, can we say, IOLink certified or that use the standard? And if it's a, a sensor that does not, data would not be transferable into this system. Is that uh, the yeah. case? Yeah. Right. So actually, digital sensors would work or any digital sensor would work, meaning any uh, zero one sequence could be transferred towards higher level IT systems, but it would not make any sense. So what is particularly interesting is, is that any IOLink device is obliged to deliver a so-called IODD file, which is originally intended to be used for configurations for configuration purposes. So for instance, whenever you integrate an IO-Link sensor into your uh, automation system, you use that IODD to set the basic parameters. And we use the information from such an IODD file for that uh, conversion that I related to earlier. So we convert the IODD information to OPC UA semantic model so that there's kind of yeah one-to-one -one association of all parameters that may be set for an IO-Link device and the OPC UA data model that is used for data exchange with the platform. Clear. So there's two big challenges here, right? I suppose. One is that many sensors out in the field currently have lack of bandwidth to deliver this data up the stack. And the second is that just because uh, zeros and ones can be delivered doesn't mean that they have any meaning as they're transferred to other systems. And what this is doing is providing the semantic model to provide meaning to the data so that you can actually know that this is temperature data, for, for example, and there's a timestamp and, and you can make use of that. The software that you mentioned, is that software written by TE, written by SAP, uh, by OPC, or, or jointly developed during the testbed? Because you, you mentioned that this is the most crucial part of the system, or let's say the, the part that's maybe not already fairly mature in the market. 
who's responsible? And also, if this is a somewhat of a collaborative effort, who actually owns the IP that you're creating in this uh, testbed? So the OPC UA stack that is available from commercial vendors, and there's also a open source implementation available. But the language extensions to convert the IODD towards or the or the, the language extensions that include the semantic model that extend the basic OPC UA functionality by that IO link conversion. That is something that my company implemented on top of the basic OPC UA model. That is currently being standardized, as, as I said earlier, so with the IO link community. And I suppose that this will also lead to some changes in the original software implementation. And I suppose that this will also be commercially available at some, some point in time. So what we are currently providing with our IoT OmniGate is a kind of proprietary solution at this point in time, but we will also certainly switch to that standardized solution once the standardization activity is concluded. Let's talk briefly around cybersecurity. So brownfield sensors are potential weak points. They might be older. They might uh, lack the brain power to host strong uh, mm. cybersecurity uh, software. Is that a component of this testbed, also figuring out how to uh, safeguard these sensors and actuators uh, when you're collecting data? Or is that something where you're saying right now you're just focusing on figuring out how to collect the data and, and manage that? And there are other companies that are working on the, uh, the security of the solution. No, actually, that's a really a crucial part of, of the testbed. Maybe also one step back here. Um, so in original automation systems, a PLC would protect anything that is below that PLC from attacks from the upper level IT systems. So the PLCs, they typically implement kind of the safeguards uh, against any attacks from the upper levels. Now, with this additional path established by this IoT OmniGate, we establish also an additional threat, which is kind of underneath the PLC. So this OmniGate component that must implement a or that must implement security mechanisms that are even stronger than than provided by PLC, which may also be not accessible for people working in that that fact uh, other than working in that factory whereas this y gateway provides an ip address is connected to the higher level it systems so this is very easily to very very easy to to reach for attackers that is why also the opc foundation is very dedicated to uh, implement security mechanisms for their OPC UA standard. And uh, we are basically using the most secure um, that they can provide here. Uh, that has also, by the way, also been aligned with the Air, um, German Ministry of Security uh, Affairs. Uh, so because uh, OPC UA has also been selected as a uh, protocol for platform industry 4.0 applications, and they needed to, to prove that those security mechanisms essentially worked for such kind of components as we provide here. That's one part of the story, and which is associated with uh, communication security. And the other part of the sto story is, of course, about endpoint security and privacy issues. And um, that's more or less up, up to RST connectivity to provide such mechanisms to that uh, Y gateway. And um, that is also why we implemented um, yeah, some, some mechanisms inside the components, such as a TPM after the latest standard, a trusted platform module, and um, also other options that, that came along with the processing unit that we use inside that device for that conversion task. And also, by the way, for some yeah, additional computational tasks that this 
device may may carry out because there's apart from the from the real time controller there's also a m5 implemented um, that may be burdened with some computational task prior to delivering the data towards the it systems i appreciate the the um the detailed overview so michael what is the current status of the test bed today yeah, so the testbed was approved in April 2016, and since then we developed the hardware component, meaning the Y gateway, which is uh, quite an unusual uh, work portion of a testbed. So that work portion even included, um, yeah, as I said, the, the development of the, the hardware itself. And the software that is running on that hardware that converts the sensor data to the OPC UA. And um, yeah, in a later phase, we established the connection towards plant connectivity by SAP via OPC UA, which is a secure connection. And uh, yeah, lately we also implemented a usage scenario yeah, to, to, your, uh, to your question the status is that the testbed is available as a demonstrator in a kind of box that we carry with us to our exhibitions and fairs so next opportunity would be at the SPS IPC drive in Nuremberg in the end of November and apart from that, of course, everybody is welcome to reach out to me or anybody else of our testbed team through the IIC marketing channels. And we are happy to discuss the details with anybody who is interested in more details. And is it the case that some of the components of the testbed are already on the market and, and um, possible to, to use in, uh, in solutions? Maybe you can you know, answer that on a component basis. Or second question, when do you expect that the test bed will actually be market ready and uh, people will be able to not just um, kind of learn from it, but actually deploy it in their facilities? Yeah, so we are indeed looking for end user deployments. However, this IoT Omnigate um, component that is uh, still kind of prototype we're still investigating on variants with different can, computational capabilities, which are also implemented within that component. So there are different options also from the price point. Of course, the SAP solutions, they are available on the market. So there are solutions for local plant yeah, analyst, analytics and also a cloud system that is available from, from SAP. OPC UA that is available from either their commercial versions available from, from different vendors, or there's also an open source uh, 62.5.4.1 implementation that is available from the internet. And of course, the, the, the uh, IO link that is, I think, um, evolving quite, quite quickly. There are many sensors nowadays available from a bunch of vendors, including, of course, IFM, our testbed partner, that is uh, offering a quite extensive range of products in this area. Great. And I should just note now for the listeners that the IIC is becoming more open towards inviting non-members who are end users, so not technology providers, but who are you know, an operator of a facility, a manufacturer, to participate in test beds as a deployment site. So if you're interested in learning about the technology, accelerating your understanding of these new solutions, then uh, please do get in touch with the IIC, with Michael or with me, and uh, we, can, we can help to figure out how to get you involved in this test bed or, or one of the other test beds that the IIC is hosting. Michael, there's also a strategic aspect to this. So certainly standards have long been somewhat of a battlefield among technology providers in terms of uh, we see this playing out with 5G right now, but we've certainly seen it in the Ethernet, the different kind of flavors of Ethernet as well, kind of controlling the gateway or, or the, uh, the entryway into a factory. How is this evolving? Do you think that we're moving in the near term towards an environment where kind of traditional gatekeepers, which would be maybe Schneider and Siemens and, and GE of uh, different domains are 
losing some element of of control over the uh, over their customers as we start to have technologies such as this that allow communication across a wider range of uh, of technologies or are we just moving into kind of a, a different stage where maybe the the standards battlefield is shifting to a different position in the stack how, how do you see this playing out strategically i think the original automation tasks and the technologies that go along with that those are still governed by such uh, oem component providers like uh, siemens and, and schneider but i think those components uh, such as we provide with that uh, y gateway they offer an opportunity to provide added value to the automation tasks. So by providing these these data to the platform level. So I know that there are also these ideas of a a soft PLC and um, running the PLC and the cloud and, and things like that. I still think that most manufacturing sites or their manufacturing site owners think in the conventional way and see or prefer the hardware solution to or to the software solution. You mentioned 5G, of course, that's that's also a way towards uh, those yeah, computational power inside the cloud systems, um, maybe to substitute um, yeah, they have the hardware PLCs of today. But I think we are still in a phase where this is uh, about uh, five years ahead. And then there's a huge installed base that needs to be maintained or extended. And that includes there are many PLCs from such OEM, original OEM component providers. And um, I think the basic business model of of Siemens and uh, companies like that, that, that will prevail. But there are additional offerings uh, that are enabled by breaking up the hierarchical automation pyramid. We will have a mixture of many different technologies in in future. However, also those companies that you mentioned earlier are very engaged in extending their offering. And my personal perception is that they are also at the forefront of those evolutions. So they are also providing their own platforms that are very dedicated to the specific tasks that we know from the manufacturing space. So maybe also their business model will transform to a certain extent, but um, I think the the competence is is still within those those companies. I think uh, that's very well said. So um, they are evolving. I think you're you're absolutely right that they're putting out solutions, and then there's going to be some natural tension between the legacy business models and where the new solutions might be driving them in the future. Michael, let's call it there. I think this has been a really interesting conversation. We've probably gone into an area that a lot of our listeners didn't know so much about previously, but is absolutely critical to making industrial IoT solutions uh, work. Uh, I think this is really a fundamental technology. When you start talking about anything that's sitting higher up on the stack, if it is not able to have access to real-time data, the capabilities of those systems are going to be you know, severely handicapped. And so a lot of there's a lot of attention, of course, on the software layers, the uh, platform layers, and so forth. I think a lot of people just don't realize that the promise that those uh, solutions are are providing really is is not um, often realizable if we don't have better solutions for getting data off the edge of the enterprise. Where can people learn more about this testbed? Do you have any upcoming events where you'll be demonstrating? Are there? Um, I mean, certainly there's a bit of information on the IIC, but are there any other places where if somebody wanted to follow up and learn more about what's happening here, or maybe more generally what uh, TE is doing in the space? where they could either meet you or uh, or online find some more information? Yeah, of course, uh, online te.com. Uh, it's the IoT Omnigate product uh, that this testbed is related to. Apart from that, our most important exhibition in Europe for the uh, automation and control business is the SPS, IPC Drives in Nuremberg, which uh, is held, uh, I think, in, in November every year. 
Um, so that's, I think, a good opportunity to yeah, have a more detailed discussion on yeah, the capabilities of that device and the test bed. And of course, as, as you said, we are engaged, very engaged at IIC level. So we are always open to discuss uh, the, the test bed with any member or, or non-member, just get in contact with the IIC uh, through the marketing channels. And I think they will always be able and happy to provide or establish the contact with, with me or somebody else of our team. So if you're listening, you're welcome to reach out to the IIC's uh, marketing team. We'll put the details in the show notes. You can also reach out to me and I can also make that connection. Michael, thanks, thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much again for giving me the opportunity to present the test bed and yeah, for, for leading through that very interesting conversation. This episode of the IoT Spotlight was brought to you by the Industrial Internet Consortium. To learn more about their joint test beds, white papers, and other collaborative activities, visit www.iiconsortium.org or reach out to me directly, and I'll be happy to make an introduction. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Industrial IoT Spotlight. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at IoT1HQ and to check out our database of case studies on IoT1.com. If you have unique insight or a project deployment story to share, we'd love to feature you on a future edition. Write us at eric.walenza at iot1.com.